afternoon. So for those of you that were in the morning session where Mary and Corbin and Vascar talked about blue catfish in Chesapeake Bay, we're going to bring everything back east again, talk about the same drainages, but we're going to switch to flathead catfish this time. So in these drainages, these are less studied than blue catfish, unfortunately, but we're starting to gain some momentum and learn about these species a little bit more. So we're going to talk about range expansion, some factors that are affecting that, or we see are affecting abundance of these species in the Susquehanna and Delaware drainages. So we'll start a little bit of an introduction to our study area. Not sure how familiar most of you are with Pennsylvania, so we'll kind of lay out our framework there. Some history of introduction, and then get into the methods, results, discussion, typical presentation type framework. So in Pennsylvania, we're going to be talking today about the Susquehanna and Delaware River drainages. There are two Atlantic slope drainages in Pennsylvania. If you know a little bit about flathead catfish distribution, they're native to this portion of the state, but introduced in these two drainages. Primarily, we'll be focusing on the main stem Susquehanna River, two tributaries, the West Branch and the Juniata, and the Delaware River and Schuylkill Rivers for this talk. So flathead catfish are currently found throughout southeastern and mid-Atlantic drainages as for the past, about the past 50 years, from Georgia to Pennsylvania. A lot of this work's been covered. Uh, Tom Kwok, I didn't see him in here, he's in the morning session. His lab covered North Carolina very well. Georgia, Tim Bonavecchio, and some of his other colleagues. Those Georgia populations, and more recently, the Virginia Tech Lab with Corbin, has done a lot of work in the Virginia portion of the distribution. In Pennsylvania, we have a much more recent introduction, so we're rough, roughly 20 to 30 years behind those introductions, and subsequently, so is the research. In Pennsylvania, first record was in 1991 in Speedwell Forge Lake. It was a single individual. We drained that lake for a dam failure in the mid-2000s, and no other individuals were ever seen. However, in Blue Marsh Lake in the Delaware drainage, that population started in 1997 and really took off and really supplemented those other populations. In Schuylkill River, they were first found in 1999 at, the, at uh, Fairmont Dam. That's kind of the ground zero of that population. I'll talk about that pretty repeatedly throughout this session. And in the Susquehanna River in 2002 at Safe Harbor Dam. And from there, spread outwardly in, in both directions. So for the distribution aspect of the talk, I'm going to pull all our records at Fish and Boat. And these come from two primary sources. All our agency-specific surveys will be in one database, but also scientific collectors that are out doing research and other types of consultant work also require a permit for us. So their data comes to us as well. So by pulling those two sets of data, we have a pretty extensive list of all the work and all the collections that occur within Pennsylvania. Um, primarily focusing on 2017 for those records because there is some reporting lags that go on. But for our internal records, my colleagues are required to be up to date. So by the end of this year, I'll have all the data to add to that through 2019. So for agency-specific records, I did add in two more years that we didn't have otherwise. In recent years, uh, since 2016, I've been leading some research efforts as well. We put those surveys in there. They're more contemporary. They're funded from outside sources, so they don't necessarily hit our, our database like some of our other records do. And for presentation's sake, I broke these into three time series. Early introduction, 2000-2006, kind of a middle range in the introduction, 2007 to 2013, and then the most recent data to show range expansion. Unfortunately, within these systems, as we've heard from on the other systems, there really wasn't systematic surveys following introduction. So you really can't do a temporal comparison of, of how they've increased in abundance. So I'm trying to grab some data to kind of give us at least a framework to think about these, these two increases in introduction. So for a temporal standpoint, we have in, annual fishway passage data from the Schuylkill River Fairmont Dam from 2004 to 2018. There were two periods of closure, and we standardized um, the capture rates to fish per hour of recording time. So we're using digital recordings at the fishway exit to document movement of flathead catfish coming through that system. And we're making a giant assumption that passage is proportional to abundance with these systems, and is really a range expansion due to the density dependent factors. We really don't know what, how this movement occurs, but we're kind of taking one giant leap here and making that assumption to use that as a monitoring device. The other set of temporal data we'll have from the Schuylkill River is boat electrofishing. It was a standardized site downstream of Fairmont Dam, uh, same time period, 2004 to present. It was done as part of annual surveys for allocene monitoring for, my, for the migratory uh, shads and herrings. So it focuses on the April to June period, 
when that migration would be occurring. These collectors use high frequency pulse direct current, four to eight amps to the target. As we know and heard about in other talks today that high frequency electric fishing is really not the go-to method uh, for catfish. And it may have biased our results in that standpoint. And we're kind of looking at this data, CPU, fish per hour. And I collected a mean for, I reduced that to a mean for each year of surveying. For abundance in the non-tidal reaches, uh, we're going to use beta tandem hoop nets with approximately 70 tower, two hour soak time, a pretty standard method uh, nationwide for characterizing abundance. Sites consist of two to four series in each river reach, depending on available space. Some of these systems have small pools. Um, being able to space those nets out so they didn't interfere with one another was hard at times. And we're going to re reduce this to the catch per series, uh, mean per site. Each site consists of four tandem baited hoop net sets. We back transformed this data to allow for recognizable values. To try to understand what factors are influencing abundance in these systems, we developed the Bayesian Poisson model, and we focus on non-tidal hoop net data from our study, which used random site selection um, to try to use to get the best results out of that. We looked at five primary primary covariates, net depth, river kilometer, distance downstream of the nearest dam, distance upstream of the nearest dam, and detection of first detection points. With preliminary analysis, as you would expect, we have a lot of correlation between some of those variables. We had to drop two of them out um, to try to prevent that from affecting our results. The Poisson model uh, formula is here uh, for interest of time. If you're interested, catch me after the session. I can break it down a little bit more for you, provide you some context and some, some information from this point, but it's pretty in-depth and not my forte. Uh, so moving on to results, uh, we're going to look at our, our, kind of our current distribution. This is early in the introduction, the 2000 to 2006 period. You see they're really reduced in both river systems, the Susquehanna and the Schuylkill. Fairmont Dam is right here. This is our first detection point as well as Safe Harbor Dam here. So you see, over that six year period, even though they've been around for now for three or four years in Susquehanna and seven or eight years in the Schuylkill, they were really still pretty restricted um, and not really widespread. One, one factor we have is the Schuylkill, several dams in place. Um, so there really was some limitations to move in. The same for the lower Susquehanna. There's four hydropower impoundments through this stretch that really limited movement early on. However, when we jump forward seven more years and extend this to 2013, you start to see they start moving their way pretty quickly once they kind of figure these dams out. So fish quickly spread up the non-tidal Delaware River. So had a tide would be somewhere in this area around Trenton. So fish would likely moved out of the Schuylkill during freshets, found their way to the head of tide and up the, up the lower Delaware, um, found their way through the dams. These, these dams have fishways in place or were notched um, to allow allocene movement in these systems as well. And on the, on the Susquehanna, they made pretty quick work of it. Uh, all four dams in the lower river have hydro, hydropower dams have fishways or fish lifts to, to move them, and they did so pretty, pretty easily. And then fast forwarding to the temporary day, you see we've now continued that range expansion up the tributaries, the Juniata, and up the main stem of Susquehanna here. Uh, another 75 or so kilometers and kind of pay attention to this, this cluster here. Um, it's pretty disjunct population, roughly 54 kilometers between the uppermost limit here and these fish up here with, with several surveys in between and no capture. So these likely might have been moved. When we look at the tidal abundance and we look at our fish weight data, which is on the left and we'll have our boat electric fishing data on the right. Uh, fish per recorded hour on the left you see early in our survey period, pretty rapid increase in abundance. So early on, this fishway was a, a relatively nice index for tracking movement of fish in the system. They were, they were coming through more and more on a year-to-year -year basis. However, this kind of fell apart late in the period. Looking at boat electrofishing, um, again, fish per hour. This is fish per electrofishing hour this time. Really not good at picking them up early in, early in the period. Um, again. High, fishing, high frequency electric fishing isn't the greatest way to find them, and their densities may have been low enough that they're just at that detection threshold. Not sure. However, later in the period, you start to see more reliable increase as we would expect 
in its population. Moving to the non-tidal portions of the river, um, this is our hoop net data again. We see increases in abundance, so squares indicate no catch in, in our surveys, and round circles that increase in color intensity in, are correlated with increasing abundance. So as the, as the dots get darker, you see higher abundance, um, higher abundance mainly in the lower river where they were introduced earlier, and increasing generally in abundance as you move upstream away from that original stocking location. Only anomaly is really this, this area up here around Scranton and Wilkesbury. Uh, that is that disjunct population we talked about earlier. Delaware still maintains relatively low population density and, and really restricted to um, the area below the Delaware water gap. We're really uncertain as to why at this point, but for some reason they're not colonizing that, pot, that basin from an abundance standpoint very well. They might be distributed pretty widely, just not very abundant in that system. So when we start to look at the factors influencing our abundance, um, the three factors that were left in our model kind of varied in how their outputs or what their re relationship with abundance were. So net, net depth was weakly positively correlated with abundance. Um, as a deep water species, it kind of makes sense. Um, Distance downstream of dam, again, was uh, negatively correlated with abundance. So the farther you went downstream of a dam, abundance dropped. And then the only significant relationship we had in our model was distance from first detection point was negatively correlated with abundance. So as you got further away from the point of first detection, your abundance typically dropped. The species has largely distributed itself by volitional movement. This is what we would largely expect. The graphical outputs from these models, again, the same layout. We'll have net depth, distance downstream of dam, and detection point from left to right. And these are uh, flat catfish CPE and, and net fish per net hour. You can see that as depth increases, abundance increases ever so slightly. Not a great relationship. Uh, distance downstream of dam. As you get closer to the dam, in, uh, pop, our abundance increases. And as you move away from the first detection point, your abundance decreases as well, as we kind of talked about from the table previously. So kind of looking at distribution, thinking back, they're widely spread now throughout the Susquehanna and Delaware systems. Um, we're they're now inhabiting about 198 kilometers of the main stem Delaware River about 130 kilometers of the Schuylkill River, about 300 kilometers of the Susquehanna extending the entire way down into the upper Chesapeake Bay at this point, and 124 miles of the tributary of the Juniata River. This rate of expansion is very similar to what was seen early on in the Cape Fear River in North Carolina, where they did about 201 kilometers in 15 years. Here we're talking 15 to 20 years, depending on what site um, we're talking about or what reach we're talking about. So very similar to what was seen in other systems in the past. And kind of the one concerning aspect is dispersal is quite rapid, despite the presence of dams. They've figured out a way, especially if there's fishways involved, they quickly negotiate those and make their way through the system. Largely, uh, volitional movement. Uh, but we do have a disjunct population that does suggest there's some degree of help. Um, the upper, upper Susquehanna population was separated by 54 kilometers from the rest of the population. And if we go think back to the abundance data, there was one central point that had higher abundance and it radiated out with lesser abundance. So most likely some anglers um, moved them there to create a, a fishery. In the Susquehanna system, we really don't have a very large game fish like this that exists. So the popularity of it in places probably prompted movement up to this system. Uh, we really don't know for sure, but it, um, it's highly suspected. And this has been seen in other places like Western Georgia and Eastern Alabama where a lot of those populations were created by angler introductions as well. So looking at tidal abundance and the, those, those measures we use for index for temporal uh, abundance, both fishway monitoring and electric fishing data were variable, but generally increased at least early in the period. However, that if we think back to the um, fishway data, there was that break about 10 years where the data got all kind of wonky and it was just highly variable and, and continued 
didn't continue to increase. Um, looking at some of the other studies, North Carolina and Georgia, roughly 10 years is when they thought they hit equilibrium. So we may have been picking that up um, with that kind of change in fish weight uh, data. However, one thing confounding this is there's a change in fish weight procedure that may have also affected our data collection. Uh, they went from dial recording to daylight only. Again, remember the focus was allocene monitoring. Uh, most of the allocene monitoring occurs during the day. So they limited their staff time by reducing the amount of recording hours. Flat catfish are likely a nocturnally moving species, so it really probably negatively affected um, capture rates on the recording. So we, that could have also compromised those two factors together, probably kind of affected the index and its accuracy using fish waves. However, it does demonstrate that flathead catfish do have a unique proclivity to use fish weight structures to both expand their range and use as habitat as well, which is kind of concerning. Um, looking at tidal abundance with the CPE of the electric fishing data, generally increases temporar temporarily, hard for me to say, using both electric fishing surveys. Um, slow to detect early in the period, densities may have been too low. They, there was a threshold value that they didn't pick them up, uh, density dependent threshold. And high frequency pulse strike current, not the go-to method um, for saying fly catfish, low capture efficiency. So the combination of that low capture efficiency and low density probably is what resulted in some of that early data being a little weak. Continuing with non-tidal abundance, um, we are unfortunately late to implement the systematic approaches. Some areas may have reached peak abundance already. So we're kind of hitting them at their high and other places may not be there yet. So the factors we're assuming are controlling them may not be yet. Um, catch rates are generally higher in main stem systems uh, than tributary reaches. And it's been interesting, I, I pointed to Juniata, they were being really slow to move into that system despite being there for some time. Um, and they're still not documented in the West Branch River, despite being both upstream and downstream in the confluence. So that's an interesting aspect that we may want to look at moving forward to kind of optimize some of the knowledge we know about this range expansion, especially if we're going to look at biotic and abiotic factors that control their expansion. These are two systems where they're either not established yet or, or poorly established, so we can kind of track them a little better. And, and looking at some of those factors um, that we put into our model in those systems and maybe expanding to some others, hopefully explain how these fish move. Most of these other studies, the fish were already there before the first day started. So we will have many opportunities to catch them early in the process of establishment. So kind of using these systems and maybe our best chance to really understand what drivers uh, of range expansion uh, and abundance flatheads have. And then moving on to what, speaking of factors, moving on to this aspect. Um, so the distance from the first detection point, the only covariate we had in our model is significantly related to abundance. Um, this suggests that movement has largely been upstream and largely volitional. Distance downstream of the nearest dam had a high probability of a negative effect. So aggregation near dams could either result from passability or largely be a result of opportunity. So maybe there, their forage base has problems passing and they're just opportunistic and taking advantage of that aggregation as well. We're really quite, not really certain as to what aspect of this, because they've been really easy to move through these dams. I don't know why they seem to aggregate downstream of them unless they have some benefit to being there. And net depth had a low probability of a positive effect. Litter suggests that fly a catfish commonly associated with deep water. Makes sense. Interestingly, geomorphology in these systems is quite unique. These are wide, shallow rivers, often over a mile wide and rarely over three meters deep. So when we're talking depth, it's all relative, um, but the depth seems to make a difference. And we're also using baited hoop nets, so we may be drawing individuals to shallow water habitats looking for food and maybe kind of confounding our results and why this uh, relationship is so weak. So our future needs are still pretty extensive. Uh, we need to really adapt a systematic approach in the tidal Delaware, or tidal Schuylkill and Delaware rivers. You know, we're kind of working with data that's not directed towards flatheads at this point in time, but to get better answers, we need to cater something specifically to those environments uh, moving forward. We also need to develop a series of sentinel sites to assess temporal change. Right now, we're kind of only looking at a, at a point in time. In most of these systems, we need to understand moving forward how this change is occurring to understand the impacts it's going to have. 
focus surveys and low density and uncolonized areas to document expansion. Like I said, most of these cases, fish were already there and established long before surveys were actually done. So we really need to get, we have a few opportunities to catch them before that happens. We need to take better advantage of that. And we need to look more at diet study to understand predatory impacts. The few diet studies have been done, largely the diets don't overlap. The prey species that were at the uh, forefront of those diets don't exist here. So what we see in this system is going to be largely different than what's um, done in previous studies. So I'd like to acknowledge our funders, uh, Pennsylvania Sea Grant. We're now working our third round of funding. Um, looking at this, this project, we'll be starting a project uh, you're going to hear about next if you're in this session. Um, next year, looking at diet. Uh, Philly Water Department, who funds all the tidal uh, monitoring data you saw, uh, sport fish restoration in um, Pennsylvania, focused most of the staff time, or paid for most of the staff time in my agency to do most of the collections, and some internal PFDC general revenue uh, for my time. We had several field assistants um, from different entities that came out and helped us over time. It's a pretty labor-intensive survey technique um, and pretty widespread, so I needed a lot of hands to help me out. And our grant administrator for really kind of making all that go in the background so I can be out pulling nets and, and getting dirty. So, time for questions. Uh, we are past the time for questions. Yeah.